Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In today's video we're going to introduce the concept of stoichiometry, one of the fundamental principles involved in chemistry, particularly what we call quantitative chemistry. So in this video we're going to introduce what we mean by this word stoichiometry. It's certainly a mouthful um, and so try to unpack a little bit more about what it's about, what it means and why it's important for us in chemistry. And then we're going to look at some of the fundamental principles about measuring properties or measuring things um, in chemistry. We talked, uh, in, just mentioned this idea that it's to do with quantitative chemistry or the chemistry involving measurement. And so we're going to look at how we measure mass, how we measure volume of liquids and how we measure volume of gases. So firstly, what do we mean by stoichiometry? So stoichiometry, as you can, you, you may well kind of gather, is that it has its um, root in, in some Greek kind of words. Two main words here, um, stoichion and metron. So literally means, or, or translates roughly to mean the measure of elements. Stoichion means element, metron, like for, for metric and, and all of those sorts of things, is to measure. So the measure of elements. Essentially, we're talking about quantitative relationships in chemical reactions. Okay, so measuring amounts of reactants before and after, whether those measurements might involve mass, whether it involves um, volume um, in milliliters or cubic centimeters, whether it's uh, other kind of quantitative units, um, it's to maybe to things to do with gas pressure or, or whatever that might be, that these uh, relationships help us to understand more about how chemical reactions work and being able to actually relate you know, this reactant to that reactant or the reactant to the product quantitatively um, is a, a vital skill in chemistry. And it also allows us to make predictions. So it helps us to say, right, well, if I start with 10 grams of this reactant and 15 grams of this reactant, how much of this product should I get? Um, how, what, what yield might I have? for example. And this concept of stoichiometry is also going to lead us in, in a future kind of video into what we would call um, the mole or a measurement unit in chemistry. But so we're talking about quantitative relationships, making measurements. Well, how do we make these measurements? What techniques do we follow? Firstly, we're talking about one of the probably the most familiar, which is measuring mass. Okay, so we've got two, um, two different images here, um, pieces of equipment that you've used before. One, you know, the, fir the first one is our electronic balance on the left, something that is much more familiar, much more um, typical, you know, and it's also quite an everyday piece of equipment. Um, you know, you probably have a version of this in your kitchen at home to measure out things. I mean, I certainly do. Um, you know, I love to cook. I use this sort of thing all the time. The second piece of equipment that we have there is called a triple beam balance because the electronic balance here, we say it's measuring mass, but technically it's actually measuring weight. In, that is the sense of the, the, the weight force on an object due to gravity. So that actual, as, as that, that bit of matter pushes down on the plate, it pushes down with a certain force that then we can translate into working out how many grams it is. But technically, it's not actually measuring mass. It's, it's measuring this force. Um, whereas a technique like this triple beam balance is actually able to measure mass because we're balancing a certain number of grams on one side with a certain number of grams on the other side and working out how many how many grams on the, the right hand side do I need to balance out the sample that I'm measuring here and then that way actually getting an accurate measure but even though technically speaking the electronic balance is measuring force and not mass it directly it is a far more user-friendly piece of equipment and far more accurate and it's certainly what we would be tending to use to measure mass in chemistry and it's very versatile you know we can measure uh, you know up to a quite a high um, upper limit but also with a high level of accuracy you know down to two or three decimal places um, but this and, and this this works for all sorts of things it can work for solids liquids and gases um, but liquids and gases also um, have volume that we are particularly interested in. Now we can measure the volume of solids, but it's not really the thing that we care the most about in chemistry. But volume of liquids, for example, is quite useful to know. You know, how many milliliters of solutions will we have, for example? Probably the most common um, instrument that you would use to measure the volume of liquid is the measuring cylinder. Okay, it might be little, it might be 10 mils, 25 mils, 50 mils, 100 mils. You know, it can go up to 3 litres if you want to measure accurate levels of, of much 
greater value. And the, the way that we actually can use this to measure volume is one aspect is that we need to consider what we call the meniscus, this curved surface of the liquid that exists um, due to the interactions between the, the solution and the, the glass or the plastic at the edge. So it curves up at the edge and it's kind of lowest at the middle, which is the point we read um, when we're accurately reading um, something like a measuring cylinder. Um, and so this is, yeah, so this is one piece of equipment to measure liquids. It's not the only one. We could go into lots of other ones that come up in more specific applications, but certainly this is one that'll come up a lot. But it's not really very useful for measuring gases because you can't seal it and it, the gases fill up whatever container that they, they take up. So we have to get a bit more creative or uh, try a different approach to measure the volume of gases. So there's two main techniques that we can use to measure the volume of gases involved in chemical reactions. The first one is what we call the downward displacement of water. Okay, so where we've got a reaction or a process that generates a, or produces a gas and we funnel it up through a glass or plastic or rubber tube um, into this container here where we're collecting it in an inverted thing like a test tube or a measuring cylinder or even this, this glass equipment called a gas jar. So basically what it does is that this tube is filled up with water initially and then, um, and, and then it's placed upside down in a, in a container of water so that all of this water is continuous, like it's all kind of all connected together. As the gas goes through this tube and comes up into the test tube, what it does is it rises to the top and what it does is that that takes up this space up here, which means that the water can't take up that space anymore. That water gets pushed down and then the water level in the rest of the tube, the, the trough kind of rises up a tiny bit as the more gas that we collect up here pushes that down. So it's displacing the water downwards. Okay, and so that then we can measure how much gas is in this container, especially if we use like a measuring cylinder and we look at, all right, well, what's the, how low is the water level? If it's a 100 mil measuring cylinder and it's down to 50 mils, then I can see that I have 50 mils of gas collected. But this isn't really ideal for a gas that dissolves well in water, because you can imagine that especially it comes out here and it mixes with or dissolves in or interacts with or reacts with the water, it doesn't get collected in the tube, or it might make its way up to the tube, but then gradually that the level changes over time as it mixes in with the water, which starts to rise back up. So it doesn't work for very water soluble gases, uh, at least in a very accurate sense. So carbon dioxide is one example that, that, that you can do it, but it's not the most accurate way to do so. Um, other gases that don't dissolve very well in water, this is perfectly um, a, you know, a, a well-designed way to do it. So if you do have a water soluble way or you don't want to, to muck around with all this sort of thing, what can you do? The second way would be involving a syringe. So rather than having the water trough, that you connect up a syringe with a plunger directly to um, a, con a reaction vessel that's producing this gas. It goes up into the tube, it pushes into the syringe, which pushes the plunger out. And then, so we're recording a specific volume in this plunger. And that tells us how much gas that we have collected. And then we can take that syringe and we can separate it. We might be able to do further tests on the gas if we need to confirm what it is. Um, but so this way, um, th this works very well for gases that are soluble in water because you don't have to worry about that aspect of the process. Okay, so we talked about what we mean by stoichiometry, the measure of elements or, or quantitative relationships in chemical reactions. And then we looked at how we can make measurements of mass using an electronic balance or a triple beam balance, how we can measure volume of liquids in, in containers like a measuring cylinder, and how we can measure or collect volumes of gases using downward displacement of water or a syringe. Thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.